from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power. Sing it out, you came. Oh, you came. I knew that you would come. And you sang, Oh Lord, and my heart you woke up. And I'm not afraid, I see your face. I am alive. You came, you came, and I knew that you would come. Sing you are.
sing, you are. Hi, this is Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join Helen and I as we walk the steps of Jesus in Israel. We'll explore all the important biblical sites, from the shores of Caesarea to the Valley of Armageddon. Then we'll go to the region of Galilee and even have a boat ride on the sea. We'll follow the ministry of Jesus throughout Israel. We'll have the opportunity to be baptized in the River Jordan. We'll float in the Dead Sea and take a gondola to the top of Masada. We'll spend time together in Jerusalem, where we'll visit the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll walk the Via Della Rosa. And of course, we'll have communion at the tomb. For more information, go to www.newlifeoutreach.org forward slash Israel. We'll see you there.
salt and light. You were salt and light. You were salt and light. You were salt and Let's get to the Word of God. Open your Bibles up with me to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. That's the psalm that most of us never read because it's page after page after page. We kind of go to the easy one, Psalm 23. You can read it in five minutes. This one takes a half an hour. But Psalm 119 and I want to look there at verse 143, beginning there at 143. Psalm 119 holds some valuable insight for us that when we study it and look at it, amazing things of revelation come out to us. So if you'll look there with me in your Bibles to Psalms 119, beginning at verse 143. Psalms 119, verse 143. Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet thy commandments are my delights. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you today for your word. Thank you for the power of your word and the promise of your word. I thank you, Lord, that as we tap into the, your word, you reveal to us the truths of your kingdom laws and rules. And as we follow those kingdom laws and ru rules, amazing things begin to happen for us. So, Father, I thank you today as we begin this new series that you will help us to understand how we change the lifestyles that we live, that they not only glorify you, but they bring us great joy and peace as well. And I thank you for that now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. We are beginning a new series today called Defeating Stress. Is there anybody here who has ever felt or are feeling stressed? Praise God. Then this was probably for you then. Because stress is a device. And I want you to understand something today. And I want you to get a hold of this. Because once this is revelation to you and you get a hold of this, you will grasp some truths of what's happening to you. Stress is a device. It is not from God. It is not designed to build you up or make you stronger. Stress is a device that the enemy uses and becomes a killer of promise, a killer of vision, and a killer of destiny. Because what it does is it ties you up in anxiety and worry and fear. And as it ties you up in those things, what happens is it stops the flow of God's purposes and destinies and vision for your life. So you become paralyzed and you just stay in that same position all the time. So the question is, is for Christians, why do Christians experience stress? What happens in our lives that makes the difference that we should not be experiencing stress? See, God's word says something to us. It's found in Matthew, the sixth chapter. You don't need to turn there. But in Matthew, the sixth chapter, Jesus himself says these words to us in, in Matthew 6, 25, 27, 31, and 34. Four verses. He says, take no thought, take no thought, take no thought. You know what that means? Stop worrying. 
Don't worry about these things. But see, because of the society that we live in, we are pressured to be something and do something that we're not called of God to be, and thus it forms a stress in our lives. When I was re uh, looking up the word stress, I, I, I found out that it says this, that stress is a feeling of emotion or physical tension. It can come from any event or thought that makes you feel frustrated, angry, or nervous. Stress is the reaction of your body to a demand placed upon it or a challenge against it. So every time there is a demand placed on us or a challenge put up before us, you and I have the opportunity to go down one of two roads. We can have the peace of Christ that passeth all understanding, or we can get stressed out. Obviously, God doesn't want us stressed. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, God doesn't want us stressed. So how do we stop the stress? How do you and I, when these challenges come against us, when these demands come against us, how do we stop that stress? We have enough power in the Word of God that's in us to push back against it. See, the Word of God in us, when we put it in, stores the reciprocal force of God to push back against all the stress, all the anxiety, all the situations, all the circumstances of this world, and we don't have to give in to all that pressure. Somebody say amen. See, it's the power of God that's in it that counteracts the demands and the stress upon us. It's the power of God in us, the Word of God in us. That's why it's important for us to read our Bibles because what happens is we are putting that counter force that's going to fight back and push back against all the circumstances and the situations of our lives that give us the stress, the Word of God in us starts to push back against it. Somebody say amen. Turn to your neighbor, tap them on the shoulder and say, read your Bible. Tell somebody else that, read your Bible. Read your Bible, it means it's victory over your stresses. It's victory over your challenges. It's victory over your demands. See, too many of us as Christians have too much stress in this world. And we're allowing that stress to control us. We're feeling pressured. We're overcommitted. We're overextended. We're overtaxed. And we're under rested. How many of us, and please don't raise your hand, how many of us operate on five hours of sleep or less? How many of us operate on six hours of sleep or less? See, that's not enough sleep for us. The doctors tell us you need eight hours. Some of us need 10 hours. By the looks of some of us, we need 20 hours. We're not supposed to drag through life. Somebody say amen, please. We're not supposed to have so much going on in our lives that all we're doing is running here and running there. I just, was, I just wrote some things down. We become taxi drivers, especially if you have children. Man, you're a taxi driver. You're taking your kids all over the place. You're taking them to soccer, to baseball, to football. You're taking them to this, to that, and so on and so on. But you know what happens as we get older? We still do the same things. We run to Walmart, we run to Kmart, we run to Target, we run to Kohl's, we run back to Kmart, we run back to Walmart, we run over to, no, Sears isn't in business anymore. The stress put them out of business. We're taxi drivers, we're mater d's, you know, we're cooks, we're house cleaners, we're all those things. And that's all well and good. We know we have to do those things to maintain life for us. But when we get all that stuff out of priority, and ladies, I'm going to talk to you for a minute. Shut your mind down. You be sitting there resting, thinking about all the stuff you still have to do and why you shouldn't be sitting there resting. If I'm telling you the truth, say amen. amen. Say it out loud so we know you're testifying. 
I know I sit there with my wife, you know, and I'll be talking about something like, you know, oh, well, we're, we're going to do this, uh, you know, or, or yes, we're having this, or yes, we're doing that, or whatever. And all of a sudden, she's telling me 30 things we have to do before we do that. Hello? We have friends coming in this week, and you're going to be blessed next Sunday because they're going to be here, and they're going to bless you. Don't miss next Sunday. No, I'm not telling you who it is. You'll be blessed. Anyway, they're coming in, and my wife is looking around the house already and said, oh, we, you know, we got to get them cobwebs down. They're 16 feet up. Who's going to see them? How many got cobwebs in their house? Come on, you got cobwebs in your house. Raise your hand right now. See, you're not alone. Uh -huh. You know, them things, you wipe them down one day and they're back the next day, right? So that causes her stress. You know what it causes me? Close my eyes. <laughs> don't look up there. It's that simple, you know, don't, don't look. See, those things cause us stress. We're house cleaners. We're all those things. And we know they have to be cleaned. We know they have to, you know, be taken care of. But when those things consume us, then stress becomes a device that's working against us. Please say amen. We place so many demands on ourselves. You know, I, I'm amazed at all the things that I hear you women talk about. You know, I can multitask, but you all multi-multitask. You multi on top of your multitasking. You know, I don't know how y'all do it. I think you're crazy. It feels like it because that's how life is. Life puts so many demands on us. So we put the demands on ourselves, and before we know it, we're doing more things than we ever thought we would. We thought marriage was going to be this great blissful experience, and all we find out is we're working all the time to make this thing secure and safe. We're fighting all the time with all the demands that are upon us. We've got our kids telling us, I gotta play this, I gotta do that. We got our jobs demanding this and that. We got friends who wanna do this and that and so on. And all of a sudden, all this stress starts coming upon us to the point that we lose the identity of who we are. And now we're no longer us anymore. We're no longer who we always knew we were on the inside. Now we're who the job tells us we need to be. Hello? Some of you are working so many hours because you don't want to lose your job and you're neglecting your family because that job has defined who you are and what your identity is. Yes, but pastor, I've got to work all that overtime because I got to pay my bills. Live in a tent and don't pay bills. Now, I'm not going to tell you who, but somebody back there just pointed to her husband and said, you live in the tent. I'm staying in the house. Get back to work. But see, here's what happened. We think that this is a modern day phenomena because our kids are in baseball and soccer and all these other things. We think it's a modern day phenomena because we got to meet the expectations of family members, friends, employers, and all that. But you know what? That same thing took place in the day of Jesus. They're all stressed out at their level. And with their thing, where are they going to get enough oil to put in the lamps? How are they going to get yeast for the bread? All those things were part of their life as well. In fact, many of them had lost their identity as well. And God, through Jesus Christ, even addressed it. Because the Sanhedrin and, and, and a whole bunch of other people there are all talking about who Jesus is. And you don't need to turn there. But in John the 8th chapter, the 25th and 26th verse, they say to Jesus, tell us who you are, they demanded. He replied, I'm the one I've always claimed to be. 
Are you still the one that you were originally created to be? Or have you allowed other people and demands of life to reform you and recreate you and mess around with your destiny and your purpose? If you've allowed that to happen, it is time to stop. Please say amen. Because let me tell you something. If you don't know who you are, others will try to mold you into what they think you should be. Hello? Everybody will, will dictate to you how you should look, how you should dress, how you should act. What should you own? What's the measure of success you have? Because you don't know who you are. And su success is a matter of individuality. It's not based on what some society levels declare as a successful person. You know, Mother Teresa took care of all the lepers. Nobody knew of her until after, uh, you know, she really became famous after her death. But during the end of her years, did people recognize the work that she was doing. She didn't allow public opinion and public pressure to determine who she was. God has something in store for each one of us. And when we begin to realize that we've got to get lined up with who we are and who God has told us, because if we don't, this out here is going to de de define and demand who we become. See, when we are in this world, we are really not of this world. And when we try to live up to the expectations of what other people think we should be, we will always fail. Hello? Yeah. We will always fail. Why? We're not anointed to live up to their expectations. And we're certainly not appointed to live up. We're appointed to be what God has asked us to be. And what he has asked me to be is different than what he's asked him to be. And what God has asked her to be is different than what God has asked her to be. And what we've got to find is our own identities establish the truth of those things. Our destiny begins to unfold to us. And now we can continue and walk along without living up to the expectations of somebody else in our lives. Because the moment somebody else begins to mold you, the moment somebody else begins to form you, the moment those things happen, you lose the anointing of God to be what he's formed you and demanded you to be. Please say amen to that. Listen, everybody doesn't have to be an executive of a major company. God can make you successful weaving baskets for the Indians because it's God's plan and purpose for your life. And once we get a hold of that, once we realize and recognize that, then we move into a place where we can defeat stress. But you'll never defeat stress until you first realize and recognize, who am I? What am I to do? What am I supposed to be in this world? The space that I take up here, what is it supposed to affect? And I get that information from God. And I don't have to ask a million questions to find out. All I've got to do is follow God to the best of my ability. You know, somebody, one time I was talking to somebody that had a very large ministry, and this is years ago. You know, and his, his church and his ministry reached around the world. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, what do you, what do you attain, you know, what you've attained so far, what do you attribute to your success? You know what his response was? I just showed up. See, I thought he was going to give me some words of wisdom, some high anointing of God. You know, I walk, in the, I walk in the light of God. You know, I can quote the Bible from Genesis to maps. You know, I can do all that. He just said, I just showed up. And every time God asked me to do something, I showed up. Would you turn to somebody, look at him, wink at him, and say, just show up. Just show up. 
That's all you got to do is just show up. When God asks you to do something, show up. When God asks you to be a vessel for him, just show up. When God says you ought to be in church this week, show up. When God says you ought to go over there and, and drop off a, a tray leche cake to your pastor, just show up. <laughs> just, just show up. How many know what tray leche cake is? How many like tray leche? That lady back there makes the best one in the world right back there at her restaurant over in Bridgeton. You can see me for directions after the service. Just show up. Just do what God has asked you to do. Don't allow all the rest of those people and to tell you who you're supposed to be. All you got to define for yourself is who does God want me to be and what does God want me to do? You say, well... I've asked him and asked him and asked him, but he hasn't shown me yet. Yes, he has so. You just haven't been listening. Where's your interest? Where's your joy? Where's your hope? Where, where's those things that light your fire? Where are all those things? Because those are the very places that will bring you to the place where you start fulfilling your destiny and stress moves off of you. So here we have this situation to defeat stress. You got to know who you are and who you are not. You know, knowing who you are not is as important as knowing who you are. Knowing what you're called to be and do is as important to you as knowing, or, or as important to you knowing that is to know what you're not called to do. You know, almost every week here at New Life, we have somebody coming to us and asking us to be part of the ministry that they're doing. And it's everything from homelessness to conventions to all kinds of stuff. And every time we get asked, we line it up and we ask these questions. We say, does it align with our core value? We know what our core value is here at New Life. We know it's missions. We know it's reach, reaching government officials. We know what our core values are and our assigned missions. And we ask ourselves, does it line up with that? If it doesn't, it's, we're done. What will it cost us? Because we don't want to change who we are unless God tells us to, and he hasn't told us. He said, stay the course. We ask, what will it cost in resources, in time, and in people. And when those things don't line up to the core, we do not allow ourselves to get involved from homeless ministries to camp ministries to whatever. Why? Because that doesn't define who we are. We're not all things to all people. Only God is all things to all people. Please say amen. And when you and I as individuals find out who am I and what am I supposed to do, when somebody else defines me and, and God is not in it, what they do is they put limits and boundaries on me. You know something? The world told me that I could never achieve any great position in the business world unless I graduated college. I'm going to tell you something. I was traveling with movie stars. I was traveling with millionaires. And I was having jobs that got me in private corporate jets and planes and everything else. And I only had a couple semesters of college. Is that for you? I don't know. What's God got planned for you? They told me if I wasn't in the Assemblies of God pastor, I'll never preach in an Assembly of God. How many Assemblies of God churches did we preach in? All the time. God said, you go, uh, people told me, you go, to do, you go to that church there in Millville, you're going to die like the rest of them. Guess what? I'm 75 and I'm still alive and I'm going to be alive for some more time because I'm not being defined by the boundaries that somebody else sets on me. Tell somebody next to you, you can't be defined by boundaries of others. You can't let them do that to you. You cannot allow them to do that. You cannot allow them. You cannot allow them to set the boundaries of who you will be or who you won't be. 
because it put limits on you. If I look at Joe, I could say, Joe, you'll never be a farmer. The guy grows more vegetables than all of us combined. He brings them here sometimes, right? And leaves them out on the front for people. I don't know, did anybody ever tell you you could be a farmer? You just did it. This guy back here. How many acres were you farming when you retired? How much? 150. 150 acres turned over three times. That's 450 acres of farming. You probably went to college and got a degree for that, didn't you? You don't think so? Well, you probably went to mechanic school to learn how to fix all those tractors. Didn't do that either. Somebody tell you that you couldn't be a farmer or anything else? He didn't care. That's what he did. And he was successful at it. I went out there on his retirement and they were sock, selling stuff off. I was amazed. How many tractors did you have? 18 tractors. Some of them were huge and big. Some of them were small. 18 tractors. I thought he had about five. He had 18. Nobody told him he couldn't buy more than five. And if they did, he didn't listen anyway. Even when his wife said, do you really need another tractor? Oh, you didn't tell her? <laughs> Smart. He didn't tell her. He just bought the tractor. You see, you can't let somebody else define who you are. God defines who you are, and anything contrary to that, it's the enemy using the devices against you. But once you define who you are, and once you say, this is where I am at, and this is what I'm doing for God. And you know what? There's some of us right here in this church right now have been defined by somebody else's boundaries on our lives and somebody else's limits on our lives. I want you to do something right now. I want you to go like this. Shake them things off. They don't belong to you. They don't belong to you because God said this to you. I want you to think about and pray about what I can do, and I want you to know I'll do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Why would you allow somebody else to put limits on you? Please say amen. amen. And you know what? We do that all the time. As Christians, we do that to our children. When our children do something dumb, we tell them, oh, you're so dumb. Don't say that kind of stuff to them. You are putting emotional limits on them. And wives, <laughs> we know we might be a little stupid. You don't have to remind us. Don't say those things to each other. Don't call, we're not allowed to use stupid in our house. Thank God. For me, <laughs> Woo, Jesus, <laughs> Pastor Ron, that's the best rule we ever had in my house. But <laughs> we don't use those kind of words. Why? Because in the power of your tongue, there's life and death. Speak life. Stop putting boundaries on each other. You know, doctors all the time try to put boundaries on you. You, you know, uh, well, you shouldn't be doing that because, you know, your, your body's not equipped to that. You didn't make my body. Don't tell me what I can do. Amen. Hello. How many of you have ever bust, busted through pain that would stop a horse, but you, you just busted through it and did what you had to do? We all do that. See, you broke through limits. You broke through boundaries. You know what? I don't care if the doctor tells you got cancer and you're going to die in four days. You tell them, thank you for your opinion, but it's not my opinion, and I'm going to live a lot longer than four days. Why are you going to tell somebody that? Because that's a boundary that puts you under stress, and when you're under stress, your body will never function. Your mind will never function correctly. And so what you've got to do is you've got to bring those things under control. Somebody say amen. And when somebody defines who you are and what you are, 
then you start battling to live up to that. But the problem with that is you don't have the, the God anointing and the God appointed direction and purpose for your life. Now you're out there trying to fulfill their expectations in your own strength. And I'm going to tell you something, we're not very strong when it comes to that. Please say amen to that. So what we've got to do is we've got to redefine for ourselves and not allow other people to dictate to us. I wrote a note this morning here, and it said, once we allow uh, other people to define who we are, then we will also allow their pressure to become what they have defined us to be. We also, when we, when we are defined by, some, uh, by someone else, we start believing something that God never said we were or we weren't. You know, God has this amazing thing. He can do things in your life without the world's requirements to do it. Some of you are living beneath your level that God would have for you because you let somebody else say, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You haven't been trained. I'm going to tell you something. The greatest trainer in the world is the Holy Spirit. Do you know what he said? God said about the Holy Spirit? He said this about the Holy Spirit. He's not only your comforter, but I've sent him to show you things to come and to teach you all things. And to teach you all things. So if God has called you to be a preacher or a teacher or a minister, let me tell you something. He's going to tell you how to do it and how to get there. Somebody say amen. You know, when I got saved and I started really serving God, well, I'm not saved, but we rededicated our lives back to him. The first thing I said to God was, God, I'll do anything you ask me. Don't make me a preacher. Yeah. And I'm not. I just share with whatever you got. See, when I took the limits off of God, then he made me what he wanted me to be. You say, well, you've been to Bible school. Nope. Well, you've been to college. Nope. I'm just like Duke. We don't know anything. We're too dumb to know we can't do it. I want you to be too dumb to know you can't do it. I want you to be in such a place where the stresses of life do not hinder you or withhold from you what God wants you to do. And what happens is when we allow others to define us, and we lose our own identity, what happens is stress becomes the reaction of the body against those things that are foreign to us. I want you to understand something. Once you got born again, the world's things became foreign to you. They are intrusions into the purposes the promises and the fulfillment of destinies that God has for you. For some of us, college is an intrusion. For others, it's the, the stepping stones. For some, certain things in life are for them. For others, they're not. Some people, well, hopefully not you, but some people can take one drink and be okay. Other people can't take one drink. We're trying to help somebody right now here at this church and get them straightened out. Last weekend, they drank in two days 60 beers in two days. Why? I can't answer why, but we want to help them. We want to help them define who they're supposed to be by God's standards. Would you please say amen? amen? So what produces this stress? Where does it come from? Well, we know it's a device of the enemy, but there are some triggers for stress 
that you can watch for all the time. The triggers for stress or stress is produced by the unknown things of our lives and the unproven things of our lives. Now just think about that. How many of you have ever gone for a test that the doctor ordered? Anybody? You went for a blood test, you went for an x-ray, you went for an MRI, you went for whatever. Anybody ever do that besides me? Do you remember what happened when he said, you're going to go get a colonoscopy, you're going to go get a stomach x-ray, you're going to do this. Do you remember that nervousness and that stress? How many remember that? You know why? Because it was an unknown. You didn't know what you were getting into. You had no idea what was going to take place in that test. And then besides the unknown of that test, it had never been proven before to you, and now this was going to expose something. They were going to find out the cause. How many have ever went, don't raise your hand for this, but you went for a test and your fear was this test is going to show cancer, arthritis, whatever, heart disease, whatever. It's the unproven and the unknown that causes stress in our lives. And the unproven and the unknown comes because of a lack of relationship with the Father. Let me explain that to you. If the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and show you all things to come, all because you don't know about it doesn't mean he doesn't. Somebody say amen. Now watch, watch what's going to happen here. I have to go for a test. I, I don't, but I'm going to use this as an example. I have to go for a test. And let's say it's a, te it's a test where they're going to inject dye into my veins and I'm going to have to lay under a machine for 25 minutes while all this stuff goes on and they're going to watch the whole thing. I'm going to tell you something. My heart is palpitating. My fears are rising because of the unknown. But here's something for us to grasp hold of. I am a candidate for stress. Please say amen. I'm a candidate for stress. Man, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay in this machine. I don't know what this stuff in my body is going to be, blah, blah, blah. But the Bible says that God already knows what is going on, and he'll have the Holy Spirit share with us and show us the results and the outcome of that. And all we've got to do is trust him. Amen. Take no thought. Now, I know that's not easy to do. I know that it's nice for me to preach it because it really, it really sounds good and spiritual. That's not easy to do. Look, I'm this mighty man of God, the pastor of this great church. I get stressed and nervous. And the only way I can combat that is before I ever walk in the door of that lab, of that testing facility, is to have the word of God flowing inside of me. Amen. It's the only way. And I'm going to be honest with you. I have laid in some of the tests that I've been through because I don't like to be enclosed in close spaces. And this one test, this nuclear test that I had to go through, you had to go into this machine and lay there with this thing going like all over you for 45 minutes. And then you come out, they inject you with radioactive dye, then you go back and you do another 45 minutes in there. I'm going to tell you something. I was quoting the word of God while I was in that machine. And I'll tell you what word I was quoting. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because I couldn't remember anything else. I couldn't remember anything about stress. I couldn't remember any scriptures about that. The only scripture that was coming through my head was... Oh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him... 
ha, ha, what was the rest of it? What was the rest of it? For God so loved the world. You say, but, but that doesn't pertain to anything you're going through. Yes, it does. It gets my mind off of the stress that's trying to get a hold of me and puts me back over here with God. You say, well, that sounds crazy. You believe anything you want. I got through the test. And I got through it, quoting scripture that had no relationship whatsoever to what I was going through. I just had something that let me hold on to God and have my foundation secure in Christ. And whenever we're facing those things that are stressful in our lives, if we'll just put God above it all. And how do we do that? Quote scripture. Think about those things that are lovely, pure, and just. Think about other times when God saved you, when God set you free, when God ministered to you. Think about those things because in those things is your deliverance from stress. And so when we stop spending our days trying to fulfill somebody else's image of us, we stop living stress-filled days. When the unknown and the unproven try to overwhelm us to the point that we're not sure whether we can make it through this or not. I don't care what scripture verse you quote. Quote anything to refocus your mind on God. Because if you don't, and you allow this stress to continue on in your life, you will meet and engage in the level of conforming and performing. And when you find yourself through the pressures of stress, under that level of stress, where you begin to conform and you begin to perform, you lose who you are in Christ. And next week, we'll talk about conforming and performing. Bow your heads with me. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. I want to pray differently this morning than we normally do. If right now in your life you're feeling the pressures of stress, if right now there is uncertainty in your life, in your health, your job, your relationships, and you are feeling the stress of those situations, if you're here this morning and you have the anxieties and maybe even the fear of the unproven and the unknown. And man, that stress is bombarding you. I want you to be free this morning. I want you to learn about it over the next several weeks so that you don't get back into that again. But right now, I want to take the words of Christ. He said, my peace I live with, leave with you, not as the world gives. So this morning, I want to at least give you a temporary relief from the stress you're experiencing right now. Maybe you're at a place in your life where you're not sure how you're going to survive the rest of your life because of health, finances, retirement, whatever it happens to be. If you're experiencing some kind of a stressful situation right now in your life, stand up to your feet quickly. You're feeling stress, thank you, all over the building, thank you. You're feeling stress. That stress is overwhelming you. That stress it, it is clouding your vision of who you are in Christ. You're here right now and that stress is eating you up 
It's affected your health. It's affected your thinking. Who else? You're feeling stress about where you're headed next, what you're going to do next. You're feeling stress on whether or not you're going to have many more years of life because your health seems to be deteriorating. You're living in stress right now. Anyone else quickly? Father, I thank you that we've recognized that stress is a device of the enemy. You said you give us peace, not as the world gives, but the kind that you give. And peace overwhelms stress because it is the power of God himself. So I release right now by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, I release peace upon you. I remove that stress and that anxiety, that worry and that fear, Lord. I remove and rebuke the device of the enemy who is constantly trying to redefine who your children are. I take them from that situation, that circumstance, that fear of the unknown or the unproven. And God, I bring them back in alignment with your word, God. I bring them back to that place where they know that they are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. I bring them back, Father, to the place where they are above and not beneath, the head and not the tail. And God, I demand that the device of stress that has been brought against them by the enemy himself be rendered powerless in the name of Jesus. And that from this moment on, they begin to fill themselves with you, Lord, with your word, Lord, with your power, Lord, with your love, Lord, your promise, Lord, and that, Father, from this day forward, the device of stress has been exposed and brought into the light, and when we bring it into the light, it is free and replaces and replaces the anxieties the fears and the worries. Because we are a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a chosen generation. Because of that, I thank you. I thank you if you're watching by television right now that you too can claim your freedom from stress because the power of the word of God and the name of Jesus sets you free as well. And I ask it for all of us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. The rest of you stand up to your feet and let's worship God as we get ready to dismiss. Hi, this is Pastor Myers. I pray you enjoyed our broadcast today and I wanted to let you know that our church family would love to have you join us here in our sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning we have dynamic worship powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Our Sunday services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study and our blast zone for kids 5 to 12. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God, and that happens at 715 every Wednesday night. For more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of our great church, and you'll see what God is doing in the lives of our families. Until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours.